Hello and welcome to Bovington, home of the Royal Armoured Corps. Now it's fair to say that I am definitely a track man, having served almost the whole of my army career on main battle tanks, starting with the Chieftain and finishing with the Challenger 2. However, in the mid 80s, we were deployed to Cyprus, working in the sovereign base areas, and we had to get conversant with two wheeled vehicles. One was the Ferret Scout car, the other was the Saladin armoured car. So today we're stepping away from tanks to take a closer look at a vehicle that dates back to the 50s. I give you the FV601 Saladin armoured car. Post-war, the British Army had a requirement for a recce vehicle to replace the outdated AEC Mark III and the Daimler Mark II. Apparently, inspiration for the Saladin came from the American M38 Wolfhound, and you can certainly see the similarities. Well, in so much as it had six wheels, but to be frank, that's where the similarities ended. Everything else was very different, including the engine, suspension and transmission. Now, whenever you mention Saladin, you automatically think of the Alvis company. And indeed, Alvis was tasked to take on the project. But at the time, they were tied up with an urgent demand for the Saracen armoured personnel carrier due to the ongoing problems in Malaya. So it was actually a less well-known company named Crosley Motors Limited who initially stepped in. And this rarity, believed to be the only one in existence, is the Crosley Saladin prototype. But even before this, a wooden mock-up was built. This mock-up had a turret mounting a two-pounder 40mm gun, known as Pipsqueak. As you can imagine, this pre-war gun was dated and simply not up to the job anymore. So an entirely new gun was required. Enter the 76mm L5A1. But more about that later. Another major difference between the mock-up and the Crosley prototype was that the turret had a three-man crew, mainly because there was actually room with a two-pounder gun. This changed by the time we got to this, the Crosley prototype. In 1958, after production of only six prototypes, the Crosley plant was closed, and the job of producing the final production Saladin was back with Alvis, becoming part of the Alvis 600 series. Using similar suspension and drivetrain components to the Saracen Armoured Personnel Carrier, the Stalwart High Mobility Load Carrier and the Salamander Fire Truck. But enough of the backstory. Let's take a closer look at a final production Saladin, the FE601C, weighing in at around about 11 tonnes fully stowed. The tyres are run flats, meaning that they could still operate with a loss of pressure. Now, interestingly, the Alvis sales brochure does say that the Saladin can run with the loss of up to two wheels. What it doesn't make clear is, of course, that these wheels can't be on the same side. The suspension is actually quite complex. It's independent on all six wheels, with an equal length longitudinal torsion bars. Damping was by hydraulic shock absorbers and rebound dampers, two of each per front and rear wheel station, and two shock absorbers and one rebound damper per center station. These gave it a really smooth ride over all terrain at a good speed. Running down the side of the vehicle, we can see a number of stowage bins. This is for vehicle tools and equipment. And just here, we can see one of our two escape hatches, exactly the same on the other side of the Saladin. And these are jettisoned from inside the turret. And really, the final thing to mention on the side of the vehicle is one of our portable fire extinguishers. And this contains liquid bromochlorodifluoromethane. That's a mouthful. And could be used on any type of fire. The hull is constructed of armoured plate and an all-welded construction. In terms of armour, the Saladin wasn't too bad considering the nature of the vehicle. At its thickest, we had 32mm on the front and around about 16mm on the sides. At the front of the vehicle are a few of the things you can see. We've got the headlights, we've also got the side lights and a horn. And smack dab in the middle of the vehicle, we've got the driver's hatch, but more about that later on. And the final thing to mention really on the front of the vehicle are these which are the torsion bar end caps. The engine for the Saladin was located on the rear underneath these louvered axis hatches. It was a Rolls-Royce B18 No. 1 Mark 6D straight eight petrol engine, delivering around about 170 horsepower and enabling the vehicle to go around 46 miles per hour on the road. The good thing about the B range of Rolls-Royce engine was that as long as they were looked after and maintained regularly, they were extremely reliable. And also, coupled with that, they were designed specifically to run on low-grade fuel. Now, having said all that, this particular Saladin is somewhat of a rarity and it belongs to the Tank Museum here in Bobbington. It was bought from the government of Qatar back in 2009 and it's actually fitted not with the Rolls-Royce engine, as I mentioned earlier, but with a diesel Perkins engine. 
The idea of that was just purely to get something that was more fuel efficient than the Rolls Royce. What about the main armament? Well, this is the short barreled 76 mm L5 A1 gun. And it was a really effective gun for the time and designed specifically for the Saladin. It could fire a whole nature of ammunition, including high explosive, smoke, illume, and a canister round, which contained 780 steel pellets for use against the infantry. Other firepower included two Browning 30 cal machine guns, one mounted coaxially with the main armament, and the other one on the commander's hatch in this mount. 2,750 rounds of ammunition could be carried on board for the small arms. And the final thing to mention, these two banks are multi-barrel smoke nade dischargers, one on either side of the turret. Let's have a closer look inside the fighting compartment. Here we are now inside the fighting compartment of the Saladin, and it was just a two-man crew inside here. At the moment, I'm sat where the commander stroke loader for the main armament would be sat. It does appear there's quite a lot of room, but don't forget, of course, that we've got no main armament rounds at all at the moment in the turret. Up to 42 rounds could be located and stowed within here in various positions around the turret. 11 of those rounds were ready rounds, and all I mean when I refer to ready rounds is that no matter where the position of the turret was, we could always access at least 11 rounds of ammunition. The controls are very rudimentary for the Saladin. Um, observation wasn't fantastic. You can see at the moment I'm closed down. Just to my front, I've got four number 17 periscopes, so very limited field of view really from there, and only one to my rear. Travis Hanwheel just across to the right hand side here. Um, Travis for the Saladin was manual, but it was servo assisted, so you did have a little bit of help. And really the final thing to mention on here was just across to my left here, they're not fitted on this particular vehicle, but you would have found the radio installation. And that's it for the commander's position. Let's uh, just pop across and have a look at the gunner's position. So I've jumped across now and I'm in the gunner's position. A little more cramped than the commander's, but certainly not uncomfortable. Just to my left here, you can see one of our escape hatches that I mentioned from earlier on, so they can be jettisoned from inside the turret. Some of the controls, across to my left here, we've got the Travis indicator. Directly to my front, we've got the gunner's sight. The sighting system was very rudimentary. Time six magnification on there with the graphical pattern and just a periscope directly above it. Travis hand wheel here. Across to my right hand side, we can see where the mount was for the Quaxley mounted machine gun that we mentioned earlier on. And just to my right hand knee, we've got the elevation hand wheel. And really the final thing to mention in the gunner's position was this, the QFC or the Quadrant Fire Controller. And that's it. As you can see, simple and straightforward. Let's now take a look at the final position and that was the driver. So here we are now inside the driver's compartment of the Saladin and it's a comfy position. Good viewing position, hatch in front of me. Um, not so easy, of course, like most vehicles when the hatch is closed, you just got that periscope to look through. Directly to your front, we've got a steering wheel, much like we had on the Ferret Scout car. Other things there, the pre-select gearbox, just on my right hand side, we've got the pre-select, five gears, five forward and five reverse gears, and the transfer lever are just across to my left hand side. As far as the brakes and foot pedals were concerned, we've got an accelerator, we've got a brake, and right in the middle, we've got a handbrake, which is the ratchet type handbrake. Instrumentation's very straightforward. Across to my left hand side, we've got an instrument panel, all the normal gauges on there, fuel, taco, speedometer, uh, oil gauge, and a few warning lights as well. As I said before, it was a very, very comfortable position, and in itself, the Saladin was actually quite simple to drive um, and also quite pleasurable to drive, very good cross country. Deliveries of the Saladin to the British Army commenced in 1959, and production continued until 1972, with nearly 1,200 being built. It was a popular vehicle which produced some novel variants such as the 90mm gun variant, an amphibious version with a folding screen and a swing fire missile edition. It was also a good export success, seeing service with around 26 nations. We even saw the Saladin as recently as 1990 during the invasion of Kuwait fighting against Iraqi forces. But in the British Army the time of the Saladin had come to an end. It had become outdated and in 1973 was replaced by a tracked vehicle, the Scorpion CVRT. And that's it from me and the Saladin. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, take care. Yeah.